I'm always been known to be the guy with the mic on the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, viewers around the world, we are here for the last chance qualifier to the eSports World Cup. One of the first and most experienced hosts for pop culture events, because that was never a thing. The best part is the people of Abu Dhabi! eSports has grown exponentially. How sustainable do you believe that the trajectory is? Here's the problem. How do you assess the mood of a player to respect their emotional state? Just be human. I'm here to share this moment for you. And my job, as much as I can, is I can give you an experience. You won 50,000 US dollars right here, ladies and gentlemen, with the EWC. Saudi Arabia is positioning itself as the world's major player in esports. What is the future that is currently being envisioned? They believe it to the point they want to be the hub of it. Hopefully we get to live to see the vision of 2030. I sat down with Bara Abdullah, a person of many talents, but most importantly, he's an esports presenter and event host. It was so interesting to learn about that side of the gaming industry, the side of the person with the microphone. Having just come off of presenting and hosting the absolutely jaw-dropping 2024 esports World Cup, Bara shares his experience in interviewing and engaging with competitors who are under pressure and winners who are overwhelmed with emotions. We dive into the future of esports, its massive popularity, its sustainability, and its potential outreach towards a non-gamer public. We also discuss parenting and how video games can actually create a stronger bond with your children if done correctly, and much, much more. And with that said, let's uncover Bara's story. Bara, thank you very much for joining the podcast. That truly is a, is a pleasure, a uh, long time coming, and I really appreciate your yeah. presence and your time. Hey. Um, and, you, you know, to, to start off, uh, could you please give the audience a, a bit of an understanding of what is it that you do? Because when I first saw you perform and, and, and yeah. basically work, I was really amazed at what you're doing. And when I looked into your work and, you know, on your social pages, I see that you work all over the place. And it's kind of a lot of things uh, incorporated into, into your work. So could you please expand on that a little bit and tell us exactly what you do? Wow, man, I wish it was that easy, <laughs> but um, I've been doing a lot of stuff, but I've always been known to be the guy with the mic on the stage. That's pretty right. much what people have been seeing me the most doing as an MC, and mostly for pop culture events. Then I ventured more into esports, got into TV, news reading. I've been a news reader for a while. Gaming TV. on the go, growing more than ever with players no longer limited to using computers or more traditional consoles for entertainment. And then a TV producer and presenter for different shows on Bahrain TV. To speak more about that, we are honored to have with us here the CEO of Memek Ogilvy in the MENA region, Mr. David Fox. Well, good evening. How are you? Very well. How are you? And then here I am right now. Saudi Arabia, helping out with the esports scenes, hosting all kind of esports events. Just finished the esports World Cup, and right. then and doing all local events over here, and doing other esports events in the region. So, I've been doing a lot of stuff, man, with what comes to media <laughs> and presenting and uh, juggling a lot of different things. But like officially in Bahrain. I am a training uh, specialist for the Ministry of Oil and Environment, which people don't oh, know much wow. about. <laughs> yeah. I took, <laughs> took some time off from that just to see what's happening with the esports scene. I've been always uh, hosting events on the side as a side hustle. I've been reading the news as a part time. I've been hosting TV shows as a side thing, never been my main. But then all of a sudden, it's like I've been giving the opportunity in Saudi Arabia to go full on and just to give it a try and to see like, you know what? Let's see, let's see what, go, what goes on. Let's see if I give this full time, what's gonna happen? So far, I was just planning for one year and here I am doing it for the second year. So still That's in awesome. that journey. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's really awesome. And I, and I really have to say that you are so good at what you do because, oh. um, you know, we connected prior and I, and I explained this to you, but I want to explain it also for the audience. 
I was at the event where you were working and where mm. you were presenting the the um the streamers kind of um, interacting with the crowd and yeah. I didn't see you but I heard your voice throughout the whole event <laughs> so the voice kind of lured me to to the specific event where the streamers were and it was really engaging you were really like really interacting with the crowd and I was really interested to see who you know the face behind the, the voice mm. um and uh, you know then I approached you because I had to know kind of what is it that you do because I, I, it's not really an easy thing to keep, you know, the energy up and to keep the people entertained. But we're going to obviously get into that. Yeah. Uh, could you please uh, perhaps talk about how did you end up in your role here? So, in other words, uh, how did you get into pop culture, into video games? And eventually, how wow. did you get the mic in your hands and start actually presenting in those events? Ooh. So how did I end up uh, being an MC in that event or in general? No, ge ge in general. Yeah, basically, how did you get into pop culture, into video games, and eventually wow. start to being a, a, an MC? Let me ask you a question, and I don't know sure. if people know about this. Do you know how did even the whole pop culture gaming event started in the Middle East or even the GCC? Uh, to be honest, no. And I'll be really interested wow. to wow. know. A lot of people don't know. <laughs> a lot of enlighten us please <laughs> and, and it's very interesting crazy enough to say i and my friends might have done the first one ever in bahrain really? back in 2010 at a wedding wow hall. that was the first oh pop culture event i ever hosted i saw the post on facebook and it's they saying like we're having this gaming event and i'm like really and this is where i just started kind of okay. holding a mic i never knew the word mc or the host i just felt like this is the mic i speak a little bit of english let's give it a try i want to see what's oh, going right. on what's the deal uh before that i did a stand-up comedy show and i'm like you know just to give it a try and then it's like wow. hey i want to do other events i got married eight months ago yeah. <laughs> i'm broke <laughs> yeah applause for that now so this post on facebook came you know, it just popped and it's like, okay, I had a talk with the owner of the event. We met up for coffee. And then after that, I just, I just started that event. So it was called Animania in Bahrain back in 2010. I hosted it. It was a gaming hall. I'm not sorry, a gaming hall. Sorry, it was a wedding hall. <laughs> it <Right>. Literally, <laughs> we, had, we had this, this uh, walk in alley, you know, um, and you can tell a day before it, or maybe a few days before that they had a wedding. So they kept still the props <laughs> on stage <laughs> with the curtains and stuff. So we made the most out of it. No, it was a wedding hall, <laughs> but we had, we had a cosplay competition over there. I never knew what cosplay was until I saw that event and I hosted it. And it was just me holding the mic and having fun for a five hours straight, nonstop. <laughs> Esports was on the side. It wasn't even called esports back then. It's just game, competitive gaming. The word esports okay. kind of like became a thing in 2015. <laughs> so I started doing that event. Then I got called to do another event because they saw me what I did there. And then all of a sudden, uh, other events taking place and they just didn't know how these events work. And we were just starting. So I'm like, yeah, I can help with that. So from one event to another, I formed up that structure, that template that I've been using in every event I go to. And I just, it became more of an experience for me. And then a lot of people just got in the pop culture scene because it was way stronger than esports. Like again, esports was not even a thing. It was just, just competitive gaming on the side. People just do competitions. YouTube was not even strong back then. You know, the whole thing with the YouTubers, it wasn't even a thing yet. It was just starting. So here I am on stage. It was stage was still like the main focus of a talent to hold a mic and go on stage. It was, it demanded some physical attention, physical energy and, and just the voice and just to keep going, going and going and going. So here I am, people see what I do and they know that they need my experience in doing so. So I started doing events in Bahrain, then I went to Saudi, then all of a sudden I'm doing an event in Dubai and then they called me to do an event to Kuwait and then been starting doing events in Kuwait over and over. Then they called me to do an event in Oman for the first time that went to Oman then Qatar, Doha, and then doing different events between comedy and pop culture. Still pop culture was a, was a thing until I got called to do an event in the Maldives in 2015. And I'm like, wow. what? What do you mean the Maldives? <laughs> <laughs> so here I am going there with my ex-wife and sitting there and just like doing an esport event in an island, on an island in, in oh, the Maldives. So it was esports related in the Maldives? 
it wasn't even called esports yet. So it was called gaming related. So here's what it was called: the WSVG, the World Series of Video Games. It's, okay. <laughs> but it was it was esports. It was pure esports. We had Hearthstone, we had FIFA, okay. we had League of Legends, and Edge of Empires was a thing. And dude, imagine the internet issues happening over there. Like oh because goodness, you're, I, you're in, don't even you're tell on me an island <laughs> at the Maldives. <laughs> We're done with the Maldives. I go back to Bahrain. I'm still doing other events, pop culture related. It was still a thing, and then I got called to become a news reader. So I became a news reader for Bahrain TV. And then with the relations with me and gaming, I produced a video game TV show on Bahrain TV over there. So that's where I kind of like had a lot of things going on. Um, I host pop culture events. I'm doing a TV show about gaming and different stuff, and I was hosting esport content on TV. It, it had good connections with the publishers. It was the only TV show for gaming in my period at that time um, on national TV, not even a commercial one. Can you tell me what TV show was that? It was called VG55 because back then the channel was the channel was called um, Channel 55, and so VG was video games. So right. video games 55. So that was the code, you know, and we had fun doing it. I mean, it was running for two years, then it stopped. Can Mr. Gus give us a shout out to Bahrain TV? My name is Gus Fring. It's my first time in your country. I see many opportunities. Bahrain TV is a great opportunity for me. Yeah, then I was continue doing so, you know, still reading the news, still doing that. Um, and slowly but surely, from the Maldives, all of a sudden I've been doing an international event in Portugal. Then I was doing, then I've been called to do an event in Macau. Then I get invited to go Whoa. to E3 to cover E3 for Bahrain TV. It oh was my just, God, that's crazy. It just kept going, kept going. It was challenging. It was definitely challenging to do all of that together. Uh, it, it was crazy, you know, having kids back there uh, at that time as well and being in a family and all of that. And, and all that stuff is like trying to do whatever I can, but it kept growing, kept growing, kept growing and nonstop up until 2019 and Corona happened and just stopped okay, everything. Yeah. <laughs> then oh, we went goodness. online, but then we kickstarted again, everything back after like in 2022, 2023, went back to events. Um, I did events in Egypt, I did events in different countries and all of that as a host. So I was known to be a host and pretty much one of the first and most experienced hosts for pop culture events, because that was never a thing, you know? Right. So it's just something that it just went along and it came and I'm like, I was doing it and it's like, I'm developing that skill and people were seeing that they thought it was a thing. Then I was helping others to become MCs. And now I'm in Saudi Arabia, helping other talents to present presenting esport events mostly and now everything changed esport became super strong pop culture kind right. of like slowed down so i'm not doing more esports stuff right now but it's a different world altogether so I, i'm sorry maybe i took a bit too long i tried no. to summarize it as much as i can so yeah that's pretty much my case but there's way wow. more going on as well than that but hey <laughs> yeah yeah no wow that's really awesome what's uh, uh, great to hear is that it kind of happened um organically right you mm. kind of just decided to go for it and it really yeah. uh in a good sense exploded for you wow well you were at the beginning you said you kind of i believe you said you spoke english a little bit but to me it seems you speak english perfectly well and you have a great <laughs> accent you. as well did Thank you practice you. that or did you go to school for that or it was not just eating uh, american cheeseburgers <laughs> <laughs> that helps, right? <laughs> you know, um, I worked at a bookstore and that bookstore for whatever, for a certain reason, they had a lot of Americans coming around it. So I picked up a cool. little bit. So I became friends with some Americans, that, which are brothers to me up until today. And uh, they helped with my English. I would say I give them a big shout out, honestly, for that. Yeah. Oh, wow. I see. Okay. So you kind of practiced that a little bit because, I mean... Uh, right now, it's so it's really really awesome. That's the thing that lured me to the to the event to come see you. So wow, good, good job to them. Props props oh. to your to, to your friends. Yeah. <laughs> Big shout out to Scott, Russ, Daniel, you guys, Joshua. If you're somehow maybe, but whatever miracle you're listening to this, <laughs> hey. <laughs>
<laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully they'll get a chance yeah. to listen to this. Wow, yeah. that's um, that's really really amazing. Um, what's great also that you got to see the big change in pop culture mm. and esports. But I want to kind of change directions just a little bit and speak about. Um, I'm a parent. You're a parent. Um, I believe in one of the interviews that you were doing. I heard you speak about you playing with your kid, mm. um, and you you know, we're able to kind of, you know, take turns and playing Spider-Man. I yeah. believe it was Miles Morales. Um, yeah. and, and it's a moment for me that I really look up to because I hope to have that moment with my son as well. Oh, you will. I want to ask you, you kind of what does it feel like to be able to share, you know, the same interests with your with your child? Man. Wow. Right. Yeah. It's It's too hard to answer, huh? I wouldn't say it's too hard. I mean, I know exactly what to say, but something maybe you would relate to maybe at some point. I, I wish, yeah, I, I, I was mean, waiting for that day. Here's the thing. Um, something, and not not all of us, of course, um, something about post-World War II parents um, that are just different. And I'll tell you why I'm mentioning that right now, okay? They, they came with a generation who just want to play it safe, who right. are kind of rough tough and just wants you to study and just wants you to and they push you so hard and some of them did not manage or don't understand this whole connection between a son and a dad and um, some are very blessed to have this tribalistic i would say familyhood and they're all connected and some did not um i i know of it but i don't think i had that kind of connection until I got to know this thing with my son. So with me, my dad, my dad is, God rest his soul, Allah rahma, he was amazing. He was like up until today, one of the smartest people I ever met or I ever got to know or I ever got to see and other kind of stuff. But I think like a lot of cases that uh, now I think uh, it's okay to say and talk that um, they did not have the best way to connect with their children. They just wanted the best for them. I think what it did is it definitely makes you more connected to your son. The fact is when it's like your son is becoming your friend. Right. You know? Oh, um, man, that's so cool. It's like it's one of those things that you sit down and it's, it's like you're not only there just to tell him how to live a better life. Hey, go study, that kind of stuff. Of course, it's important. Eat your veggies and all that kind of stuff, right? right but when right. you play with your son, you're actually connecting to him on a different level. You're solving puzzles. You're saving worlds. You're sharing moments that it will grow up. You're showing him to, to how to think, how to behave, how to be patient, all through a game. It's is i can't express how beautiful that is you know yeah. where a lot of times right now when a father and a son maybe don't always share the same interests right your dad will be doing his thing you're doing your thing and yes you can sit down you have food you talk that kind of stuff but when you actually serve sort of like both of you genuinely like the same thing yeah. whether it's cars whether it's traveling whether it's a workout whatever whatever it is and and you both genuinely love the same thing it's only but but now it's not only a dad son relationship you guys are friends because they're yeah. doing stuff together you're asking your son how can i work this out how can i do this and when your son feels that he can be at value to you it builds right. his confidence it builds his character yeah. it, it just shows him that you know oh my god i'm I'm at value. I, I'm adding to him. And the same thing, you feel that your son is like developing in front of you. You're doing things together. I think it's not only about the fact that it's just video games. It's It builds a beautiful character together. Um, wow. A lot of, I've seen a lot of cases um, where fathers and sons don't connect as much. They're living in the same house and all of that. Some are blessed and lucky and they're having a beautiful time and some are not. And I say it openly, they grow up and they just don't develop that best connection with their dads and there's, there's, there's a void and then they'll go seek validation somewhere else, whether it's right. through another model or online, offline, and they try to do that search because they didn't find that with their dads. 
but I've seen some examples where dads and sons through video games. I'm not saying it's the best way to do it or it's the, or it's the least or the worst, whatever. I'm just saying it's an example. Yeah. And the fact is that me and my son, we both talk about gaming and he loves games. And when he sees his dad doing those stuff, the cool stuff on stage in a gaming event, yeah, like it, you know, yes, yeah, sometimes it pays well and, and you meet a lot of people, but you know what really matters? Like the best thing ever. I received a message from my son. I'm in Riyadh, he's in oh, Bahrain. Man. And he goes like, Baba, I've seen you doing the EWC, the Esports World Cup. You're doing Street Fighter. Did you see what happened here? Dad, I've seen you on TV. I'm like, what? Oh my God. <laughs> and he's sending me this and I'm looking at it and I'm like, this is the best thing ever. Right. Are you kidding me? Right, right. Are you telling me? <laughs> and then it's like, Baba, it's like, Baba, I'm, I'm so happy to be your dad. It's like, oh, I'm so happy to be your son. I'm like, oh, come on, don't make me cry now. <laughs> so, so. I, I'm it's, about to cry because of this. Oh, man. Dude, you will experience that with your son, you know? In the future, awesome. a lot of a lot of kids want to have fun. And the fact is that they will not hide from you, you know? That when they can really trust important. you to be themselves fully, you know? And, and they see you not only as a father figure it, or you, they see you as a father, a friend, a person that can talk to about everything. They don't understand this connection in gaming between a father and a son. It's, it's just not like the fact that you're just playing a game. You're doing things together. It's quality time. It's solving puzzles. And then there's a game that you like, he doesn't like, and then you get to see the game that he likes and you like the game because he introduced it to you and vice versa. There is so much that can be done. And at the same time, it just builds trust, it builds confidence, it builds character, it builds a lot of things. And then from gaming, the same thing can be replicated in other areas of life. You know, that that's like- For sure. Like he, he associates you for being the fun person. So he'll come to you always right. to feel good. He will remember that <laughs> dopamine that he gets when he's spending right. time with you. So then when something happens to him, he comes to you because that was associated. I, I, it might be weird for a lot of people to think it's just, dude, you're playing games, but there are, there's so many things that happens around it that people don't get to for sure. realize. For sure. So, so I, I say I'm very much blessed that I had this. My dad hated video games. Allah <laughs> He hated video games. And, and he had it that I was spending so much time with it. So I was always hiding away. And anything I, I want, I even told him like one day, it's like, I want to do things to involve with video games. Like, no, and he shouts at me and all of that. So this association that video games is just something for me. And I can share that with my dad. I will only, only, only share video games with my friends. But, right. you know, I can just think like all that time that could have been spent with him sharing this cool times together. Um, I would say, um, you know, low in Arabic, which is uh, if that, uh, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I would just say, you know, I think we just different generations, but the future generations, yeah. I guess us born between the eighties and the nineties and now having kids together and, and all of that going to the future. I think there is more of examples where now our generation can actually relate more to our sons because we kind of grow in the same electronic world right now in digital world. And we use social media. We both play video games. We both do a lot of stuff. We understand. We talk about the same celebrities on YouTube. He's, he watches right. a, a guy called, <laughs> like, here's the funny part. So he tells me, it's like, oh, Baba, I, I watch a guy called Benderite. He's funny. I'm like, okay, just a second. So I show him a picture of me taking a selfie with Benderite. It's like, no way, you meant Benderite. No. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Oh, or, my God, or, that's or awesome. the, Ameri the American Palestinian um, content creator, Anwar. He says like he sends me, he he sends me a clip of him doing a funny clip about uh, something in life, and then it's like oh but look Anwar what he did I'm like cool no props then I sent him a selfie that I took a selfie with Anwar it's like what the heck <laughs> so so that's these just, things that's it, top of the top right there it's just it's just like it's it's beautiful that's all I can say I feel so yeah. blessed. Like at this point, it's not about me. Like I don't want to show off to people or anything. It's just, it's like, I don't want to, it's not about getting the validation or the likes or the follows. It's just, it's just this, it's just this thing with my son. It's, yeah. 
it's that's the most important thing, of course, a hundred percent. I understood this. I understood this as soon as I had my son. Before that, it's hard to understand what it feels like to mm. love your child, um, mm. and it's really hard to express in words. And it's really, I really connect with everything that you're saying. Mm. Also, uh, in regards to your father, because my parents were not as strict, perhaps, but anything to do with video games, they said, "Look, absolutely not. I wanted to be an artist. Absolutely not." They said, "Study, study, study." And so, yeah, I, I had to kind of, in a way, do what they're told. But I, I can fully understand where they're coming from as well, yeah. as you said. Yeah. But concerning yeah. the children, uh, just 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 today, about an hour ago, uh, my my son just came. He's two and a half, so he's he's a bit too small. But he came into my room. <laughs> he went him. into my uh, onto my desk. He took my mouse. He took my keyboard. He put on my headphones. He was just pretending right. to play games, because he. Um, and he's like, da 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 da, game, game. And I'm like, look, my son, oh, just wow. wait a little bit. We're gonna be gaming. Don't worry. And uh, so that's why I felt like I really wanted to ask you this question. Like now, being at Real is all good and great, but it's like I can't wait to go back to Bahrain, spend time with them. I mean, yeah. I would imagine. I would imagine. But hey, you have such a wonderful connection that I'm sure this connection will never be severed, and you maintain it really well. You know what you're doing, and it's a great Thank lesson you. that you're teaching to your son. And I'm sure he's gonna you know, be even better than you in this regard with his children and so far and so forth. So let's go. Man. Uh, uh, that, that was really, really, really pleasant to hear from you. Thank you. Speaking again of children and again, as a parent to a parent, a parent with a bit more experience than me, <clears throat> and I think maybe some other parents who are gamers would be uh, interested to hear this. Um, could you talk to me about how did you introduce uh, video games to your child and how did you maybe ensure that he plays you know the right games at the, at the start and for the right amount of time and so that this whole kind of video game thing doesn't end up being a quote-unquote a bad addiction but rather a great passage of time mm, you know things have really changed <laughs> things have really changed like gaming in my time then what is gaming when my son got born and when my daughter got born um it oh you changed. have two children nice yeah okay. yeah yeah Noor and Abdul Rahman. Nice. And, and what is gaming today? Awesome. It's just different. I mean, my advice 10 years ago would be different than advice I give today, different than advice that I would give before even having my children. How can it be not an addiction, but at the same time can be something that could be positive, that kind of stuff. And interestingly enough, that's some of the research I'm doing here in Riyadh as well, how to make gaming more positive, more health, healthier, how esports can be healthy at the same time we cannot shy away the fact of the other side of gaming i mean it's, it's there it's of course there. We, it's there. we have to yeah we have to acknowledge that the addiction the bad posture um how it can just get you addicted to the dopamine and uh, non-stop the competitiveness the stress yeah. in esports it's all there it's all there the fact is that the risk of abuse when you go as well for, online abuse oh man that's not don't even get me started there with cyber security and this and the cyber <laughs> abuse and that kind of stuff oh god oh yeah so yeah. i would say as a parent even if you're not a gamer you know thankfully now on youtube and in different places around the world there are educating parents how to deal with their uh, kids when it comes to gaming and esports that kind of stuff right especially now we got governments like saudi arabia promoting esports like an economical pillar for the vision 2030 so they're they're spending a lot they're investing a lot and they're going and they're learning as they go and i'm here with one of the operators of the saudi esports federation who did operate it uh, partially for the esports world cup and that's part of our conversation so now back to the question how can we it is definitely spending time with your kids play with them understand what's going on it 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 helps a lot um now there are a few brands like minecraft like roblox i mean we get to spend some time yeah. with them and they play and there are games that can be more competitive like csgo or like valorant that kind of stuff the thing is even yeah, publishers yeah. right now do acknowledge the whole thing with cyberbullying and and how they can how their games can be healthier friendlier for the kids and all of that so they're playing part in this as well even though now it's of course it's a business they have to run and all of that but they do understand the importance that the fact is that you got yeah. people you got kids from the age of nine even younger and you know young adults spending time with these games so they understand that they have to be careful with with their content and how it goes i mean 
I wouldn't say there's a straight answer for this. I mean, I think you will yeah. have your way. I'll have my way. I would say in that case, just definitely spend time, learn, you know, ask your kids, what are you playing? Can I play with right, you? Right, right. Let's see what's going on. Get into it, right? Get into it. Because here's the thing. My time, our games, told stories. Resident Evil, Final Fantasy VII, The Last of Us, God oh. of War. Yeah. Uh, all these games, you know, Red, Red, Red Dead Redemption. MGS. Oh, Metal Gear. Oh, God. How could we forget Metal Gear? <laughs> I actually interviewed David Hayter. This, no. I actually, oh, God. dude. Oh, That's dude. Crazy. Oh, dude. I met Hideo Kojima. Biggest Kajima. fan. Oh, my uh, God. It's, 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 no way. That game taught us what politics is all about, the, the, war, the business of wars. <laughs> exactly. We never knew we yeah, were exposed yeah, to that yeah. couple, much stuff. The thing is, today, gaming is different. The game became more social, you know? It, it, gaming is about creating content. Live services. It, and all of that, it's just different. Um, the thing is, this is something we cannot change. It's happening. The few, these, the kids coming in, my generation is kind of slowing down. The new generation is going to be into gaming, but gaming is going to be more of a lifestyle to the point that, that right now they're going to communicate more through gaming. So we have to understand it. Like my kids generation, they don't use WhatsApp only because they have to with their parents, right? They use Minecraft and they use Roblox to, to connect and chat. Facebook, Instagram, yeah. TikTok, it's WhatsApp, it's, it's not for them. That's, that's for us. For them, they're using uh, Roblox and Minecraft. That's their way of communicating and to get things together. So as a parent, mm -hmm. again, I guess it goes back to the point, spend time with them. And the thing is, we need to understand is something else as well. Gaming will change more in the future. The moment, and I kind of believe for it sure. might happen actually, because if the gaming te technology, the game gaming will, is going to be more of an open world plus in the sense that it becomes a metaverse the moment games becomes infused with blockchain technology and web3 and crypto and nfts then you will have the play to earn system then you will see the fact that kids today they say they want to they want to become youtubers now the, before like i want to be a doctor i'll be an astronaut now they want to be a youtuber they want to be a streamer they they want to be yeah. doing all of that because they see people like Benderita or PewDiePie and all those. They are the ones who are pretty much becoming role models to some, you know? Yeah. So, absolutely. With huge they, followings. Uh, huge dude, followings. And, and everybody wants to be followed. Everybody wants to get the likes. So they, they, their values changed. In the future, it will change even more with yeah. blockchain when games will have to play to earn uh, facility in the sense that when your kid is playing a game and earning money for playing that game and becoming famous in that game, it oh, changes. Awesome. <laughs> it, it changes. It changes yeah, everything. Yeah. So I guess... Completely, um, completely. How to make a positive? A, we have to learn. A, we have to learn. We have to spend time. We have to spend time playing with them. Even if we're not interested, I mean, for your kids, just learn at least to a certain point. Ask them questions. What's this whole gaming deal what's this why PUBG is so popular what's the deal with rocket league what is who's this benderita so when the thing is when your kids are explaining to you the whole thing you and not only you're learning but they're connecting to you and now they feel that they can trust you more and now you're connecting back and then as you get to learn more and more you're an adult some of us have business mindsets maybe at some point what happens to make this more positive you can actually direct your kids um, to work with you in different products or different business ideas. It's like, oh my God, my son's a good yeah. player. Oh. Content creation is a thing. Let's see if we can put that together and make him a content creator and we help him to do that. And I'll become his dad slash talent manager at the same time. Who's better to do that than the dad himself? So this is like one of the ideas. So I think not only just connect with him and just make it positive, make it practical. It's like, okay, now he's gaming. There Now today you can make money out of gaming. How can we leverage on that so maybe that's another way to do it i'm sorry there was not was it wasn't a straight answer sorry it's the, i don't think there is a straight answer that's the whole reason yeah. for, you know for kind of having this conversation to be able to open up and have long form content uh, to to discuss all these issues but just to summarize and i was you know really thinking a lot about these questions personally for myself and i came to a small conclusion that you know one of the two most important things for children uh, for a child sorry or for your children is a to be present 
that's probably very like probably on the on the first place to be present and the second point that i think is very important is to nurture their interests and i think oh. it's exactly what you're saying is is be there be interested whatever sparks their imagination their cre creativity and sparks their you know happiness dive into that and kind of you know nurture their interests and then it'll be much easier to control um the whole situation the, the whole um mental situation mental states oh. of, of of your kid i i believe oh. in, in two words so i think we're we, we we're on the same page on that that was very interesting but the more i kind of pay attention to your work uh to all the things that you post on your social media to your past work the more i really realize that you require you know quite a high level of emotional intelligence and kind of uh, an assessment of another person's mental state you know wow. to be able to kind of read the room to maintain mm. like the right pace the energy um mm. and you know most importantly like to conduct like you know on the spot interviews with the winners um you know or, or, or with players who might be feeling um pressure from the competition how do you kind of assess the mood of a player and adjust your tone uh, to respect their emotional state during uh, uh, these moments because just recently you were interviewing i believe the filipino team that won uh the fight i forgot the game that they won and but but the girl was crying and and you did such a good job yeah you did such a good job to interview her but the emotions are so high so how do you deal with all this um you know uh, emotional stress and everything yeah mobile legends yeah. at the ewc you mean yeah e mobile legends yeah, the, mobile exactly legends. yeah esports world cup yeah 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 and ladies and gentlemen viewers around the world your MVP is Shanoa! Yay! I know, emotional, not only you won the MVP, but you won for the Philippines as well. You know, taking place right now, not only you changed the narrative of the story itself taking place here, not only you are here in the first ever Esports World Cup, but also you won 50,000 US dollars right here, ladies and gentlemen, with the EWC. Just be human. If the thing is what happens. Okay, interesting. How do we do that? It's like, it's like when you see a friend crying, what you're gonna do? If you see him laughing, what you're gonna do? The thing is what happens is that is a lot of people when they go on stage, and a lot, I mean, like most, when they go on stage, they have this perception that when I go on stage, I have to be a certain person. I have to stand a certain way. I have to be formal. I have to be standing this way. I have to speak in a certain manner. Oh, it's because I, the camera's all on me. I, I should be very structured. For me, at some point, I understand the fact that I'm living the moment with this person. So I think what happened, I don't I put a mindset that I have to be standing in a certain way. Of course, I mean, you have to be presentable. You have to be like, you know, respectful and all of that. But at the same time, you understand that the show is not about you. The show is for them. So what you do, you put the spotlight on them and you talk to them as a person who is actually caring, who is interested in you. Not because he has a show to run and the show is more important. And then there's a producer telling you what to do. And there is like, stakeholders that kind of stuff you forget about all of that and you focus on that person and you say this is your moment i'm here for you i'm listening i know and you understand the impact of the fact that when for example that player when she won the mvp right mvp she yeah, won yeah. she won fifty thousand us dollars that's to some people wow to some people you saved lives with that yeah. She goes back. Oh, yeah, for sure. It can be life-changing, yeah. Her mom could be sick. Her, uh, um, And I, what I understand as well, that time when she, she won that cash, there was a typhoon hitting the Philippines, and I don't know what kind of damage okay. they had to go and manage. So when you go back with that amount of money, and all of a sudden, it's like God sent to you. And the fact is that you know, you you actually, through whatever reason, that game, that's your skills in that game kind of managed to get you that money and you go back with that, it's life-changing. So for me to understand that, to understand part of the struggle they go through, 
Not because it's the show right now. Not because they're spotless. Not because we want to get emotions. Because we felt it. We understand what that feels when we don't have money, and you know when people have to go there and and he just they just want to know how can they eat tomorrow, and and all of that, and he just become connected as a human. That's I think where it really yeah. helps me to understand who I'm talking to. And that's the same thing I apply in TV. The same thing I apply in different uh, shows. That kind of stuff. I connect with them because at the end of the day, it's not about me. I'm, the show is not about me. I'm here as a servant to help yeah. you. I'm here for you. I'm here to share this moment for you. And my job, as much as I can, is I can give you an experience. So that's how we see it sometimes. That's why a lot of people, when they go on stage, like, hi, my name is, I'll be your host today. My name is Bob Dula, and I'm your host today. And it's like, like, for me, I'm like, I go on stage, and I'm like, I don't even mention my name. And it's like, you know, it's you. I, I I'm on see. stage. I will ask people their names. What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? And they, I acknowledge them. Okay. I try my best to put the show to them. The, even though I, I try to make sure how this will work for them. Like a lot of times it will give me a schedule with certain times and we're strict. And it's like, guys, why, who are we doing the show for? That's for the people. Yeah. So why are we restricting ourselves to timing? If a certain show is doing well, I'll prolong it. But the short certain show is not doing well, we kill it. If people aren't clicking, we kill it. If people are doing well, we having fun together, we're prolonging. So what happens here is that because at the end of the day, it's the energy we're getting from people. And how do we read that energy? It's time. It's really time. I've seen people host great hosts. Yeah, they practice, have the amazing right? voice and all of that. They stand on stage, center stage, and all of that. But the thing is, they did not read the energy too well with people. If they want to, if they want to get them, hey guys, are you ready? They people's like, yeah. It's like, so then he goes. But what happens with time? I get to understand. Yeah. You know what? You want to tease the people a bit. Are you ready? Yeah. It's like, okay, guys, I'm sorry. It doesn't seem you're ready. <laughs> so, are you ready? <laughs> mm, okay. You know what, guys? I will right. leave the stage. I leave the stage. I go to them face to face, and I go to the guys. Okay, look, guys, in front of them, I'm here with you. This is our moment. Forget the stage. Forget everything. I'm here with you. Same level on the ground. Are you ready? And then like everybody blows up because we broke yeah. that barrier. A lot of times people see you on stage, right. they think you're on a higher tier. Uh, we're not on a higher tier. <laughs> we're, if, if anything, we're, we're your tier. There is no tiers. We're just together. I just right. happen to be on stage because I want to direct the energy and we want to have fun together. That takes time. It took me a lot and me just going and just, you know, just taking the risk with a lot of moments and just breaking Definitely. that barrier and failing, failing my way to until I understand what works and what doesn't. So, yeah. For sure. Yeah, definitely. When you fail, you you, you always learn. And uh, what you said about risking it really um, is yeah. appealing to me because I think that's what you got. You got to go for it, see if it works. If it doesn't work, you bomb a couple of times, but then you learn your lesson and you come back. And then after that's a certain amount of time, way, it, it's just second nature, right? It's just second yes. nature. That's really it's, interesting. You can't, and you can't always really, play it You safe. really have to understand. Exactly. Of course. If you play it safe, you'll never achieve the greatest heights. Uh, you got to, you know, high risk, high reward, as, the, as they say. <laughs> But you really have to be able to read the people, read the room, uh, read, uh, you know, different people have different, as you said, different problems going on in their lives. And um, for someone, a win is an okay thing. For others, it's a life-changing thing. So it's uh, really yeah. great to see your perspective on, on these types of things. If we can move on to the world of esports um, a yes. little bit, uh, as a person who's kind of in the industry, you know, you know, uh, you know qu quite a lot more than perhaps me and, and, and many others. Um, my first question would be, um, you know, we, we know perfectly well that, you know, that esports has uh, grown exponentially uh, in the last decade, huge, huge uh, growth rates, and it became extremely popular, right? Today, this is an official sport. Um, you know, there's a lot of money to be made for people and, you know, the absolutely jaw-dropping events are occurring right now, like the recent um, Esports World Cup that was hosted mm. in Saudi Arabia that you were a part of. I mean, that was a spectacle. That was, wow, I have no words to describe this event, how great it was. Um, and that really put esports on the map. I think um, even some of my friends who are not into esports whatsoever called me up and said, bro, are you looking at this? And I was like, man, you're too late. <laughs> I've been looking at this a long time. So great, great event, great spectacle. And uh, thank you. You know, 
esports is there. My question is, how sustainable do you believe that the trajectory is oh. and why? Oh, God, man. Wow. <laughs> I've been having this conversation with, with different people. I mean, prominent people in the esports scene. Um, pe people in Portugal, um, people with big stuff and, and players, organizers, broadcasters, streamers, talents. How, how, how sustainable is it? It's a tricky one. It's no, interesting. It's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. I mean, That's the, I'm, right? I mean, I'll be honest. It's a tricky one. It's, uh, because the thing is you, um, here's the problem. Oh, I wouldn't say it's a problem. It's just the nature of it. Okay. When the word sports came in this world and calling it esports, electronic sports, okay, um, they didn't call it um, video game sports. They didn't call it VG sports. For yeah. whatever reason, they'd been called electronic sports, and the word electronic can be anything at this point, right? But now it got associated to video games. Now, they replicated the sports formula, which was happening in the Formula One, MMA, UFC, soccer, basketball, and all of that, WWE and all of that. Now, what is the difference between sports and esports at this point? First of all, when it comes to sports sports, like soccer, nobody owns the ball you're playing. Like it's a soccer ball. Maybe people own oh, I the see. design of it. Nobody owns the air you're breathing. They own the stadium. Yeah. They own a lot of stuff. They own they own maybe the, the, the rights for certain leagues, for the Formula One, for basketball, for MMA, there is, it's an open world. It's in, in the real world, right? At the same time, it's that one sport. It's one sport. Soccer is one sport. It, what happened, you just develop that sport. Right. And they had all these years to bring up all these stars, to build the stories, yeah. to the merchandise and um, teams are able to live long Manchester United or Brazil or all the big names, Ronaldinho, Messi, Real Madrid, and all of that, yeah, yeah. Real Madrid and all of that, because the game is stable. The <laughs> soccer game is stable and there are always people watching it no matter what. Now the issue is when it comes to esports, at some point it's short lived. So now today you have rocket league. Okay. People are enjoying rocket league. Tomorrow it will slow down in views. So all these players who spend time learning the game, putting all of that push in one night, it's not a thing anymore. Or what or what happened in Apex right. Legends it was high and then low, high, and then it became only high in certain yeah. countries. So now we're learning that different games are just popular in different areas. Like for example, MLBB is only mostly popular in Asia and the Philippines and all of that. Not really popular over here. Honor of Kings is different. Uh, FIFA. Oh, AFC, Street Fighter, Tekken, Mortal Kombat. And then the thing is, when it's more sustainable, it's hard to see in esports because we're not dealing with one game, we're dealing with gazillion games. League of Legends, Dota yeah. 2, Street Fighter. <laughs> then you have all these games. And then all of a sudden, even yeah. games were, are not competitive, became competitive. And all of a sudden, even Super Mario can be in esports because at some point it became competitive. We can finish the first stage in the less in less time that became a sports. The thing is, the world of yeah, video games, runners, any, game, yeah. any game can become a competitive game, but some games are obviously more geared for competition than the other. So it's easier to compete with like Tekken, like Street Fighter, the EFC, like Rocket League, and then yeah. all that kind of stuff. So the war sustainability, it's kind of a hard thing, in my opinion, to see in esports because you have to create it. The nature of it is not sustainable. You have to create the sustainability. And there are a lot of things to consider. The publisher, the operator, the country, the views, the is the game popular or not? The developer. Like for example, the deve oh, the developer. And not only that's a lot of players. They know it's short-lived. So what they do, they do the most out of it, and then they exit. A lot of them they exit, and then all of a sudden they're into crypto, or they're into content creation, or they do whatever, because they know it's kind of short-lived, and, and they want to make the most out of it. So now the narrative is becoming clearer and clearer. Like when somebody says, oh, I'm 40, I want to play esports. Say, oh, you're way too old. I'm like, way too old? Then what is old? They're way Only too old, old now, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, 25 is old. And are you kidding me? 25, 25 is old? 25, yeah. It's crazy. And then it's like, what, it's what is young? What is young, man? 
Yeah. So it's so, all so, oh, because of the reflexes, because of your time and all of that. So so now the problem is esports in certain places in the world is dying. It's getting a lot of hits. Other places like Saudi is, is booming. It's getting a second life it, with some certain games. But where is it all heading? Is esports still going to be, you know, in relation to what we do? In, uh, is it still going to be a thing the next three or four years? We don't know. But in Saudi Arabia, they're super confident that it will mm -hmm. be a thing. That's why by 2030, yeah. we're building the biggest esports arena in Gadea. We're doing a lot of things. So there are different people seeing different things from different lenses. I have my own way of seeing it. Other friends are having own way, well, their own way of seeing it. Some people are, are betting their lives on it. Some of us, like so ourselves, like, you know, we're being careful. Okay, we're going to give it our time. We're going to, of course, we, we see what's happening. At the same time, we see how can it be consuming, can be challenging. We want it to work. We're putting our time to work. Even my friend yesterday, we're talking about this and putting a strategy for it. We're just like, okay, how can we make this work and even prolong it? And how can we tap into different esport areas and make it happen. So I would say sustainability is something you have to work on and build. It's the, the nature of esports can be unsustainable, can be sustainable depending on the game, depending on the country. Are you in Korea? Are you in the States? Are you in Bahrain? Are you in Saudi? Are you in South Korea? Are you in Brazil? Are you in Portugal? What games work in Portugal? For example, the most sustainable players I've seen so far are players who play CSGO and Dota 2. But when it comes to Rocket League and Fortnite, you don't see much people. Street Fighter, you have people up to age 45, like Daigo. So we have examples, but it's one of a million. So when it's only one of a million, it's not really the most successful ratio, you know? I so understand. for me, I'm just representing myself here. Sustainability is still a tricky thing in esports, in my, in my opinion. It needs, to, it needs to be worked depending on the Understood. game, depending on where you are. There's a lot of variables you have to consider to make it sustain. We have to work on its sustainability. Gotcha. Yeah, but, well, there's definitely games that have, you know, stood the test of time, like you just mentioned, you know, CS, um, not, not just CSGO, but just Counter-Strike in general, uh, yeah. and Dota 2 as well. Um, actually, speaking of that, um, the creator of Dota 2 is now released uh, Deadlock. I don't know if you played that, the closed, uh, closed beta? Not yet, not yet. Hmm. So that's going to be an interesting addition to the esports scene. I've had the opportunity to get invited uh, to play it. So uh, basically, the story goes: Ice Frog, who's the creator of the initial uh, mod for Warcraft Three, that then became Dota Two. Now he's actually working on this title, mm. and it's really interesting because it's uh, essentially Dota Two, but as okay. a third-person shooter. So instead oh, of seeing from top down, you actually control that. one player. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. It's super cool. Yeah. I've played it. I'm not obviously any good, but I think that's great. Um, it would be a great addition. Um, but what you're what you're kind of implying is games that stand the, um, you know, kind of remain popular through time are the ones that can help sustainability. And that kind of really. Um, uh, goes into my next question because in my mm. one of my previous podcasts i was talking to um a guy called travis smith he's 15 years old and he is one of the youngest esports ceos so he's also in the industry he's trying to get his team up and running okay. really interesting okay. and nice guy um and we touched upon kind of this subject as well what he mentioned was is that uh you know there's a lack of innovation going on right now in the esports uh, scene Okay. Um, specifically because of some of the things that we talked about, mainly that, you know, uh, the most popular teams want to remain popular and play the games that they're good at. So they don't mm. want these games to change. Whereas oh. this discourages developers to create something new and something, you know, that could perhaps bring a I, new wave of interest into the sports. Totally, it's kind of um, back totally and forth between that. the players, the teams and the yeah, and I understand that rightfully so. Obviously, the teams want to play what they're good at, and they don't want to kind of just stop and play a new game and, and kind of learn skills all of a sudden, all, all again. But kind of, do you, uh, what do you make of that? Do you think that's a, an advantage or a disadvantage for the industry? The thing is, that's the issue with esports. I mean, when you call it an industry, it means there's like, a common ground for everybody. But the thing is, when it comes to esports, each game is its own industry. Like okay, each game yeah. is its own world. It's like what applies on League of Legends may not apply on Street Fighter. What applies in EAFC doesn't apply to Valorant. What applies on CSGO may not apply, apply to Dota 2. It's just too different, man. 
And that's the issue is like, it's like when somebody says I'm an esports specialist, and I'm like, what is that? <laughs> I see. <laughs> what, is, what is an esports specialist? What do you exactly do? What game are you specialized in? <laughs> you know? <laughs> You can't just say I'm an esports specialist and, and just stop. And I'm like, no, man, you got to be more specific. Not because we're trying to show off or anything. <laughs> it's just, it's the nature of it. So for the CEO to say what he said, I understand what he's saying. The thing is, some companies, some publishers use esports as a marketing tool. It's not essential to it. It's like, the, it's, it's, an, ex, it's just an extension to it. The game is doing well as it is. Some uh, some games got into esports because they don't want to miss out on the train. It's just, you know, with the full, whole point of creating shows and creating content and making money and creating stars, which brings more people to the game and that kind of stuff. So they still see it as a, an extra leg. To some companies, they see esports like, we don't care. <laughs> we really don't care. I mean, I mean you do you, we don't, man. and some companies know it's like they do their game essentially to be competitive, to be esport related, they believe in it. So, I mean, in his case, uh, when what Trevor said, it depends what game he was referring to, um, because yeah, it does, some games like they just slow it down, they don't want to be too innovative, so they won't lose the players who are playing today, even though they want to expand more. But then if, if the game is too competitive, it's too esport related, maybe it makes sense for them. But there are games who are just heavy on the lore, heavy on the story. They have casual gamers. They're not there to compete. They're just there to enjoy the game. I want They want to see more characters. They want to see more of the story. So they have to update it. And some games like Street Fighter VI or like Tekken 8, what happens, they're too heavy on esports. They would nerf. They would puff, they would go back, they'll bring new characters in to, to prolong the game, that kind of stuff. So you see, I'm just in a few minutes telling you different stuff happening. And I'm like, yeah, uh, I don't know if we can call it an industry. Yes, it's well, com gaming competitiveness is taking place over there. But we're talking about each game, each company have their own way to make things happen for them. Like Dota 2 has its own thing going on. League of yeah. Legends has its own thing going on. Rocket League have their own thing going on. Um, like like everybody has their own league, their own championship, even to the point, like I don't know if people notice this or not, but for example, a lot of these uh, games, they don't even use the word esports in their championship. It's like, you know, hey, this is three, here's like the Capcom Pro Tour. Here is the Tekken uh... League Masters. Here is the Rocket League Championship. There isn't even the word esport there because the oh, thing okay. is everybody have their own world. You go to their websites, there is an esports section. You can read about it. It's under that kind of stuff, all of that. But then who is really emphasizing on the word esports? Then you, you come down to the fact it's the federations, it's the organizations, it's the, it's the teams, uh, it's the organizers, it's um, whoever is seeing esport as a business, they would use it. So it's like, I don't know why this is the case, but the thing is for when it comes to innovation, now you want to upgrade, you know, when you want to add more to the game, you want to innovate and you want to add more stuff. It really depends on the publisher. It depends on the developer. It depends on the business developer. It depends on a lot of things like, does it make sense to upgrade it and be more innovative or not? Sometimes they make business decisions. Sometimes they make an actual upgrade decisions. Like, hey guys, if we do not upgrade our game, if we do not up, we miss the train on a lot of yeah. things. You know, the game today, for example, is based on a server. To innovate it, you have to go to a blockchain because with blockchain they make more money. But then when you go to a blockchain-based game and they infuse in, uh, NFTs and crypto, it will change how the game is and how it relates to. So then it's like uh, they do their own research and development. It's, okay, what works for them? So sometimes it's only about business really, you know? Mm, yeah. How yeah. can we generate more income? Uh, does it make sense to upgrade or not? So sometimes they look at casual gamers, they make more money than the eSport players. So they will go with that. Sometimes the game's like, no, it's more esporty, so it makes more sense to do what esport players are asking them to do rather than the casual gamers. So there's a lot of variables, man. You know, it's like when it comes, for example, soccer or basketball as a sport or MMA or the other games, real sports going taking place in real world. That is an industry because everybody shares the same thing. 
It's the same sport. Yeah. yeah. You know, but when it comes to esports, like what game are we talking about here? It's, it's, you see, that's to me, again, I'm representing my own thoughts here. It becomes tricky, man. Really tricky. I see. I see that, yeah, it, it definitely is tricky. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard for a non gamer to probably understand this. Um, mm. But uh, as as a person, you know, that plays games, you, you and I, and maybe people that are listening to this podcast, it, it makes sense that e each game is its own world, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. as soon as a new one is introduced, it's like a new universe, and you totally. gotta learn it from from the beginning. My my next question would be, you know, we have seen definitely a, a huge, you know, obviously rise in esports, and this kind of introduced also a demographic shift in viewership. Um, and especially with younger generations, right? Many people now, or maybe even kids, they don't play a certain game, but they watch somebody else play that game or they watch a championship of that game, right? And that is really cool. I'm all for that. You don't have to be playing a certain game to like somebody else watching it. But what um, my question would be, for example, I am, I'm into sports. I love playing soccer. I love many other things, but I... I play soccer, but for example, I like Formula One, but I don't drive cars. I'm not racing cars, but I still watch it. So it would be interesting to see non-gamers, complete non-gamers, uh, actually pay attention to the esports e e world and look at the competitions. So my question would be, do you see a day when complete non-gamers, people who have nothing to do with the video games, who are not gamers at all, will become esports fans and will be able to enjoy esports as much as they enjoy watching their other favorite sports that they practice and don't practice at the same time. Man, I gotta say, this is a really good question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. It is a really good question. I mean, because we were so fixated on gamers, 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 and we were so fixated on on esports and all of that that only only people who watch esports are gamers themselves and then we cascade down to who people are interested in that game and if we do anything non-gamers related it has to be a festival we bring uh, like for example what happened in the esports world cup we would uh, we were operating a hall called the scc play gaming hall uh, which is the scf uh, arena actually or scf uh, the saudi esports federations arena and um we were considered like okay for the non-gamers what should we do for them they were just board games we just bought board games jenga that kind of stuff and they liked it they enjoyed it because we thought we considered it that you know they're not going to be interested in esports they just want to do the non-gaming related stuff you know yeah. or we bring games that are so simple to play and that's it now to your question huh that's very interesting it's like like it's you a said, good thought experiment. You, it is. I mean, you're a, you're a soccer player, but you would watch F1 because obviously not everybody can drive an F1 car. Yeah. Let alone driving that speed to begin with. Oh, for sure. <laughs> you know? I mean, I mean, you lose weight just looking at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there's, there's many examples of that, you know, uh, tennis or whatever. Many people enjoy the sports that they don't participate in. I think there is one common... Uh, factor that it's pleasing to the eye it's, it's fun mm. it's easy to understand what's happening you know a car is going a certain speed the fact of that speed itself is just thrilling yeah. to see that speed happening the you sound of the understand engine it, right it kind of stimulate other senses in you right and you understand what's happening if we go back to the esport question it's going to be pretty much going to the same answer what game are we talking about right <laughs> because for example <laughs> You got gamers, they like hate mobile games. It's like you got some gamers, like they look at League of Legends, like what the heck is going on? <laughs> who's winning? What's Who's doing what? <laughs> or they look at Dota 2, they, it's like to them it's torture. It's yeah. torture to look at Dota 2. It's like, what is going on? I mean, I, I, this, is, this is a game? People actually enjoy this? But we look at games like Street Fighter 6 or Tekken 8, it's it's easy for them to understand what's happening. It's pleasing to the eye to them. It's fun. It's fast paced. It's, it sees the music. It, it, it seen the music. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> you, <laughs> look at the music. It's the late night. <laughs> it's, it's, no, dude, let me tell you one thing. Uh, 
I'm still with the aftermath of a dental surgery from yesterday. Oh, I was man. not okay. supposed to have that surgery at all. I just <laughs> went for a checkup and said, we have to do the implant now. And I'm like, what? So I'm still having the aftermath. But anyways, as we were seeing the music, <laughs> uh, and that stuff, uh, take a place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you see the waves and the wavelengths. Anyways, um, and we put everything together. You see like play, the characters like Jin Kazama with this like six packs and all that going against his dad, Kazuya, in the game with two characters. Uh, one of the uh, like you know, infamous characters in the game and they knew what they were doing and all of that even if we don't know what's going on it's fun to watch you know it's fun to see the fight scenes because it replicates the fighting scene or replicates real life uh fights with the mma and all of that so I, I would say it depends on the game obviously efc is soccer it's a simulation of soccer so people will watch that it's easy to understand it PUBG. It's kind of tricky. I mean, for it's a popular game, but still a lot of people sit down because the whole thing with Battle Royale, you have to wait for everybody to die until the real action happens in the last three or yeah. four. Yeah. So, so you have to like, know uh, what's going on. You have to wait. You have to know what's going on. So it's not really the best spec thing for a spectator. Overwatch 2 was an issue, uh, was an issue, but then they changed how the spectation goes. So they see a lot of things. I think it's tricky for non-gamers or non-esport players to actually enjoy esports because it it, it does have to do a lot with the variables around it so it depends on the game really so certain games you can see people they're enjoying it Tekken 8 EFC uh eFootball but games like Mobile Legends Dota 2 League of Legends that that kind of was tricky for non-gamers to understand what's going on so to answer your question can that happen I would say Yes and no, and depending on the game, really. Um, I mean, but the fact is how you related it to the fact that you're a soccer player and you would still watch a wrestling match, although you know you never did wrestling before, you will still watch an MMA fight, you will still watch uh, an F1 racing uh, championship and all of that, because I guess it's easier to understand. The, the, the objective of the game is easy. It's not right. complicated. It's cars racing going with high speed whoever finishes first will be the winner and that's pretty much it there of course there are layers to it to the points the speed and all of that if you're interested more in the game you get more into technicalities of it same thing with soccer there's more to it than just 11 versus 11 and going and just shooting in different goals and that kind of stuff but you know basically if you don't know what's going on you just want to enjoy it as a casual uh, uh, spectator, you can do that. Same thing with MMA, right. same thing with wrestling. Session with what WWE uh, did is that they understood the whole thing of the power of narrative and storytelling oh, between yes. different wrestlers. Oh, yes. So they give each wrestler a name, each wrestler a story, and all that. And that's what they try to do in esports and different games as well. They want to create a story behind, you know, the drama around everybody. And that's what a lot of games are trying to do is storytelling. It's always about to bring up a story. So I guess it's it's still tricky to see non-gamers, non-esport people. I mean, let alone <laughs> uh, the gamers themselves that they're trying to understand different games happening. Uh, it's, I don't know. I mean, it's, it depends on the games. Again, I mean, I'm not saying what's good, what's bad. I'm just saying it's the nature of it. It's just too dynamic. It's... Uh, it's becoming a big monster to, just to understand. But then, then they say the esport industry, I'm like, is it really an industry or we're talking about different games? Because still, you got a lot of publishers, they own their game and they have their own world. For example, League of Legends Worlds happens to be one of the biggest esport events that we have on this planet. And then Fortnite on the one side, they do their thing. And then other people are trying to add this entertainment side, like what Riot did to all their events. They went crazy with the world. They went crazy with telling a story. They went crazy with their characters. They went crazy with 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 the entertainment side. And a lot of people saw that, you know, because they didn't want to put on a show. So they hired people from all over the world to 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 bring them a show. Bring them a show. So even who doesn't know anything about League of Legends would actually wants to know what's going on because of a show, because of Arcane on Netflix, because of different things. And now they're entering the fighting genre with uh, um, 2XKO. So now they, they, they're tapping different things and bringing the entertainment things even to 
big fighting genre as much as they can. So it really depends on the game, depends on a lot of stuff. Um, I know people watch the League of Legends Worlds because of their show, because of the this the the opening act, and they watch a little bit of the uh, of the match because of the hype, but they don't know anything about it. But it's so so. Would that consider it to be something to do because esports is strong, or is it because League of Legends is strong? You see, now that's where the question comes in. That's definitely a good question. Uh, it's it's more visible. This transition of non gamers to gamers is more visible, at least to me, in movies, because you see now a crazy uh, deep dive or I don't know um, investment into creating uh, movies based on video games and TV series based on video games. I mean, some are good, some are bad. Most of the time, it's not, you know, the best thing. But um, yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's it, for the non-gamer, it's great. That's the whole point. Like for the non like I, I'll take my dad as, as an example. I spoke about this also before. I played The Last of Us. Obviously, I loved it. Oh. He watched me play the whole thing. Oh. Like the, uh, on my third playthrough. And he couldn't stop watching the game. He loved watching me play it. And he loved the story. And so when, then when the series came out, he watched the series and we connected there because that's because watching a series for him is a normal thing. Yeah. So we connected there. And I see this connection potentially happening to others, like people who never played Fallout, they watch Fallout and then they're like, okay, so there's a game called Fallout. That's cool. And they might connect to their kids or to, to whomever. And so it's easier there. But with esports, you're right. It's a bit tricky. It depends on the game. Uh, like, for example, you know, it's easier for me to watch cliff diving like real life cliff diving because it's super yeah. interesting. Like the guy's yeah. falling off a cliff. I would never try it, but I can watch it. Then, for example, it is to watch curling, you know, an official Olympic sport of curling. I would never watch that. That's not as interesting for me. And I, yeah. I see your point. I see your point. Like comparing, for example, I don't know, the fast pacedness of a CSGO or Call of Duty or whatever to the more uh, intricate and detailed strategy uh, based game of Dota, you know, so mm. you really, you're right. You're right. Um, but I, I think eventually, perhaps with the generation of our kids, it might get easier and easier and easier. And maybe the connection will be uh, rather rather closer together than, than today. Again, seeing the tremendous amount of work being like, like taking place right here in Saudi Arabia. Along That's exactly my next question that was about the... We're not even talking what happened in Dubai or what's happening there or what's taking place in Abu Dhabi or what Bahrain is trying to do as well here and trying to push forward or what's taking place around the world. But then when you get deep into it, you see different things from different angles. It's like, it's okay, are our kids going to see esports, even though they're not esport related, are they going to see esports and watch it because it's just a thing or not? Um, we don't know, man. So all I can say is that we are working on it. We're paving the way. Some like some people here in Saudi Arabia are super confident and that's just very inspirational. And we learn, we learn as they go, you know? So sometimes we just need to take the leap of faith and see how it goes. But what is your question? Let's see. My question would then be, um, you know, seeing as, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is positioning itself as, you know, the world's major player in esports. Um, I wouldn't say in the esports industry, as we talked about, I would say in esports in general, you know, with a massive investment, uh, into the scene and as you mentioned before the plan for 2030 um, and just generally the grand vision of the future of esports and everything it is to become uh. um, how do you think this will impact well two questions actually how do you think this will impact the esports ecosystem globally and my second question would be if you know the answer to that of course where is this vision coming from and uh, what is the future that um is currently being envisioned. So I think what's happening here in Saudi Arabia is that they don't look at esport as just a way of entertainment. They actually see it as an industry. And and there are like this vision of the esports and gaming strategy that they're looking at the fact of hiring up to 39,000 people. Wow. <laughs> what they will oh see it as an goodness. industry in the future. Wow. There is a vision. And it's not a secret. It's out there for people to see it. And that's why we're seeing a crazy amount of investments taking place right here in this regard. But the question is, the question is like, in your sense, what you're saying is that why is it happening? Yeah, in a way, like what is, 
um, what is that vision? The thing is, it's good news for me. I love to see a country do this. I love to see a country do this. And this just puts into perspective how huge gaming is and how huge it can become and how many sectors to it uh, there, there, there are. Right. Uh, esports being one of them. And since Saudi is, go is going all in on it, and all in, I mean, to the level of... Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I could not even possibly imagine an event as good as yeah. what happened now for the 2024 World Cup. It oh, was totally. just through totally. the roof. So what's this vision? Why does it exist? Like, do you do you have any idea, uh, like, a, a potential future of esports and what is to come in 2030? They believe in it. They really believe in it. And, and, and they really see it happening. They're they're putting a lot of their investments. They're putting a lot of their time, the effort. They're they're hiring a lot of people in and out. They're getting cons consultants. They're taking expertise from different kind of people, and they're just making it happen all together in one place. They're they're collaborating with ESL. They're collaborating with different esport entities and all that, putting it all in one place. They really believe in it. Um, Universities as well. Excuse me if I oh, interrupted oh, man, you. It's huge happening. programs. It's ha it's huge uh, education big programs. Time, big time. Now, now, in that sense, they see it not only as an industry. They see it as a pillar, an economical pillar. Because wow. I think a lot of a lot, a lot of these things, it's like there's a digital transformation taking place in the world. So I don't think it's just because of entertainment. I think they have they see the implication of it in the next four or five years all taking place in one place. So I think they are not only visionary they're being realistic about it and the more we go further with it and they they see they're signing different kind of like agreements and projects the more we see like okay there it's unfolding it's happening it's okay i, I we kind of see what they're seeing right now because they're like not only being visionary not being not just seeing the numbers it seems like they believe it to the point they want to be the hub of it so let's that's, that's what i said the... earlier Crazy That's what part, I said right? earlier. That the thing is, sometimes like I, like a person like me, you know, saw things from a different lens. But sometimes it's not about what we see as well from our own lens. Sometimes, it's like you know what? Even though we think we know what was going on, whether it's good or bad, I think sometimes you just want to take a step back and just look at it from a different lens. Yeah, because definitely. They see things from a different perspective. So definitely. like I see it from a different perspective when it comes to pop culture and esports that kind of stuff. But then you have the higher ups. Like whether it was a PIF or savvy games, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. they come from a yeah, strategy level, games be huge development level, PIF level, even higher than that. They have researches, they've done a lot of stuff. I think they see things from a different lens, and that's what I tr I'm learning now is to see things from a different lens as well. That's why I'm taking it in you know, like, like step back with what I think. I still there, but at the same time, I am learning how to see things from their side. And wow. I'm still learning. So all I see, it's not about what's taking place right now. All I see is this unbelievable amount of confidence. I think the one thing we can just say or do at this point is just we live. Hopefully we get to live to see the vision of 2030. And then I'm like, oh, this is what's all about. Wow. Okay, yeah, cool. I, I can't wait for that. Wow, that's awesome. I, and I'm really excited for that. And here's a question I'm very interested in. Yeah. Uh, and very interested to get your opinion on. So yeah. we've recently seen, you know, the absolute immense success of Black Myth Wukong, the game that just came yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. Absolute immense success. I mean, they sold, I believe it was 10 million copies in 48 hours. And yeah. Like, whoa. And concurrently, they have, I believe, over 25 million people playing on Steam. Yeah. You know, absolutely crazy numbers and good for them. It's a fantastic game. Mm. Um, now, that put China on the map of video games, yeah. right? It's a game made by a Chinese studio. They kind of were super quiet about it. Mm. Four years or five years in development. That's when we got our first trailer. Mm. It came out. Boom. My question, do you think uh, Saudi Arabia would have an interest in a huge AAA gaming title and, uh, you know, have something as big or even better than Black Myth Wukong. I've been hearing stuff mm, like that in the really? development. Like, that I don't know much. I don't know much, to, to be, be honest, honest when it comes to game development. I know the art game development is a thing in Saudi Arabia, definitely. They they have scholarships for it. They are people studying it. They are people learning it and they're pushing for it and they're promoting it and definitely working hard to inspire people to do so as well as there are wow. Saudi game developers as well trying to 
crack the code and get into it and see how it works. Now, is there going to be a game like the one that took place in China? Um, I think we just have to wait and see. That would be just so insane. And uh, 100%. you talking about the fact that there's rumors kind of all over the place. Well, but I think it would be great if it, the rumors are true. I mean, are there rumors? Or are they just talks? The thing is, when it comes to game development, I'm not too in the know of things. But one thing for sure, what I could tell you is that over here, there are a lot of visionaries. I'm saying this not because for I'm sure. in Saudi Arabia. I'm saying it because it's just truly what I see. It's a fact. The yeah. amount of brilliant, smart people in Saudi Arabia is crazy. The, the, the people who are, live, who are working in Saudi Esports Federation alone, you know, that's just something else. Then you have Savvy Games. Then you have the Esports World Cup Foundation. And the thing is, these are kids or even people who are younger than me by like 20 years, but I learn from them. Some of them, I even look up to them, even though they're younger, maybe younger than me, but I look up to them at this point. I learn from them. I, I go and it's like, there's no age barrier. I just go and like, I ask them questions and I'm learning from scratch and that's how it goes. But the thing is, I would not be surprised if tomorrow they announce that Saudi Arabia is actually going to develop a game similar as the one that took place in China. I would not be I, surprised because the I thing is, wait. here's. Like, like, I think what happens, like, if uh, if states has Hollywood, if China has different cultures going on over there or different industries they're known for, if Japan has anime, uh, India has Bollywood. So I think at some point, some point, maybe Saudi Arabia wants to be associated to different kind of entertainments as well. And no, eSport is there for the grabs. Let's just work on that as well. But at the same time, if there's going to be a game as good, I yeah. wouldn't be surprised. That is done by Saudis for the world, and they take their I time think, to do it, and they train them. I would not be surprised yeah, that I would not it be would surprised. Take place. As well, as well. I would be pleasantly surprised. That's what yeah. I would say. Uh, I really can't. I hope that in the near future, this does. I think there's so uh, such a large potential for uh, there to be a big positive impact with a game like that. And well, yeah. anyways, let's wait and see. To finish off our conversation, what do video games mean and represent to you? It definitely was the first entertainment that I ever got interested in or immersed in by the age of five. Mm -hmm. It was my passion. It was at some point the th only thing that I would go to for having fun. It was like I always felt that it's okay. Whatever happens, I got my video games. At some point, it was an escape. And then it was a distraction, um, but then it became a bit too much. Then it became an addiction. And I had to let go of it and then came back because I just wanted to enjoy it as a hobby. And then it became my moneymaker. I became the host for some of the gaming uh, events out there then it became my career it became my identity what i wanted to be known for what i want to be part of it became that i became a consultant in certain areas of the gaming industry it the thing is it meant so it means so much to me it meant so much to me and it took me to different levels because of gaming I went around the world because of gaming I'm talking to people like yourself you know because of gaming it got me connected to so many to so many things it got me to learn so much and at some point it it is teaching me how to let go because I had to let go of gaming at some point and w where am I gonna go with it I mean it all depends what pans out after this, I think in my case, I tapped into everything that I can possibly tap into as a person when it comes to gaming from a hobby to, to a job, to creating friends, to going around the world, to traveling, to working in it, to do different stuff in gaming, to become a consultant, to become a media personality, to have a team, to have my own TV show. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> about gaming. <laughs> I think I tapped with everything that I can possibly tap into with my skill set when it comes to gaming. I won't be surprised that at some point I will just let go of all of that and start just 
spending more time with my kids and maybe my kids okay. will bring them back to gaming because I swim one of my sources of connecting with my with my kids. So maybe let go of all of that yeah. and then just becomes just quality time right. with my kids. It could be my retirement plan even. And if gaming becomes like a play to earn system on blockchain, maybe to become a side hustle, a side gig for me. But awesome. <laughs> I won't be surprised that I'll go, I'll grow bigger in gaming and just go crazier and crazier. Or I just stop all of this and just become something I do with my son. It just all depends on how it pans out in the next, uh, in the coming few months, actually. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, I mean, that's a very beautiful answer. A uh, very beautiful answer. And I always say this when I'm speaking to guests, to my guests, there's no wrong answer when you're answering this question to each and every one of us. Video games are something very specific and personal. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, again, thank you for uh, spending your time on the podcast. It was so interesting to speak to you. Very insightful. Uh, there's definitely more to speak about, uh, perhaps on a, uh, on a different occasion. But thank you again very much. Uh, personally, wishing you nothing but the best. Uh, a lot of health thank to you. you, to your family, to your kids. Uh, thank you play a lot of games and it's so interesting to follow you to follow your work um, i'm very glad to have had the chance to connect with you and um you know hopefully we'll keep in touch and thank you very much for your time oh thank you so much for reaching out i appreciate this